Well, good morning, Harvest. All right, confession at the top. My grandbaby's in the house. It's going to be hard for me to focus this morning. But we're going, to be, uh, we're going to be okay. Hey, I pray that you are well. Happy New Year. Here we are, 2024. You ready for it? Oh, I am. I am. I'm so excited. Hey, I'm curious. Um, how many of you do a word of the year when it comes to, like, a new year? Like, you pray, you seek, you discern. So, several of you do. Uh, for those of you that do, if you don't, that's okay. That's okay. But for those of you that do, here's just your yearly reminder, be very careful the word that you choose. Because <laughs> I just find like, you know, joy, that sounds great. But let me tell you, the Lord is going to teach you what joy really looks like in the face of uncertainty and hardships. Last year, it was rooted. That was my word. I was so excited about it. Colossians. Paul says, I pray that you, being rooted and established in the faith, would know the love of God. Sounds great. But see, here's the thing about roots. If you've got a shallow root system, when a storm comes through, it's going to blow you over. So what I found, just personally, like leadership and just leading, and I had so many storms last year. But praise God, it's like Psalm 1, when you dig in deep roots. So these words are, are great, but just be careful the word that you choose. But I take it seriously. So, all right, joy a couple years ago, that was tough. Rooted last year, that was tough. So I'm like, all right, how can I find a loophole here? Now, I know that's not right. I know that's not, that's not good. I'm confessing right now, but I'm praying. So last week we had, um, just real quickly, we had a, a couple days to unplug, to disconnect. We went to the beach. It was great. So it literally was a week ago. It was New Year's Eve, and my wife was like, have you, have you figured out your, your word yet? I said, no, but I trust. I've been praying. The Lord's going to reveal it. I'm going to figure it out. So it's New Year's Eve. We're going to dinner with some friends. My wife found this hole in the wall shrimp shack. I mean, same grease guaranteed that they've used for a hundred years. And uh, we get out of the car and we're walking in and it was like a literal bolt of lightning. The Lord revealed my word in a way that I never could have imagined. I stopped my wife. I said, I've got it. She said, what is it? I pointed. I got a picture. Let me show you. Keep it shrimple. Shrimple. <laughs> shrimple. I love it. Now, it's not Greek. It's not Hebrew. But come on now, in a big, big ocean, just keep it shrimple. When you're faced with hardships and difficulties. And I gave it a test run this week. Had a staff person come up to me. And they were just talking about, you know, I'm stressed out. I got this thing. And I just looked at them. I said, can I just pour into you right now on behalf of the Lord? And they said, please. I just leaned forward. I said, keep it shrimple. They said, okay. So anyway, I'm not sure that led anybody to the Lord, but I'm just telling you, here we go. We're going to keep it shrimple this year. And we're in, as Pierce so beautifully said, we are, thank you, please remain seated. We are in a stewardship series. Now, stewardship, um, yes, you know, it, it is about giving. It is about finances. And I am never going to be one to shy away from that. It's biblical. There's a precedent to that. There's a joy that's found in that. But I also want you to hear this over the course of this month. Listen, stewardship, there are so many different ways that stewardship appears in our lives. Giving is an important component of it, but there are other ways. Example, if you join our church today, we will give you the membership vows. And one of the vows that we ask you is this. Will you support the church with your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness. I think that actually is a really good definition of what stewardship is all about. So over these next several Sundays, we're going to, in this series, That's Our Church, we're going to talk about what it means to be a guided church, what it means to be a grateful church, what it means to be a growing church. And today, I really am excited about this word. We're going to talk about what it means to be a generous church. Church. So will you join me in a word of prayer and let's just dive in. I love the way the Lord put this together this morning. What an honor it is to share it with you. Let's pray together. Father, I am so grateful for the time that we have today. And Lord, I, I don't know those who are here inside the space, those who um, are watching online. I don't know where hearts are as we look at a, a brand new year. Um, Father, some of us, we just come in with such expectation and hope and just uh, an anticipation to see everything that you have in store. But honestly, some of us, realistically, we are still limping from the difficulties that we experienced in 2023. 
but yet. The same God of the mountain is the same God of the valley, and it's actually in the valley where the fruit grows. It's actually in the pressing where the sweetest of oils come from. So Lord, you're working in the mountain, you're working in the valley, so open up our eyes today as we talk about the gift of generosity, as we look at what it means to be a generous church. Father, just reveal something fresh. Reveal something new. This is what you do. The word is alive and active. So, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. We thank you for the generosity found in Jesus and this story that is our story. Be glorified in it. And it's in the mighty name of Jesus that we say amen, amen. All right, if you have a Bible, we're gonna start here. We're gonna start in John chapter three. All right, so if we're really going to keep it shrimple, let me go ahead and give you the overview. Like if you could take this entire sermon and you could just boil it down to a single sentence, it's this. We are a generous people because the gospel is generous. Because the gospel is generous, we are generous by default. What do I mean by that? Well, let me just reference John chapter 3. You know, I've heard it said, a new year, a lot of people start the the Bible in a year. And, And if you're doing that, you're about seven days into Genesis. And I love to say, ain't no crazy like some Genesis crazy, right? I mean, Old Testament, some are like, what do you do with that? Well, I'll tell you. If you're doing this, hang in there. The secret to reading the Old Testament is to see Jesus on every single page. And the beauty of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation is this. If you boil it all down, it really comes down to one verse. More than likely, you know it. This is not the first time you've heard it, but it's this, John 3.16. For God... So loved the world that he he gave. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. My friends, the gospel is generous. There's a, a story that is a bit of a legend. I actually remember this when I was in radio. I remember reporting this story There was a guy in Longview, Texas. I I grew up in East Texas, Marshall, Texas. And there was a guy from Longview, and what he did was he was like a collector. He um, had all this knowledge about stones, geodes, rocks, things of that nature. And he goes to a gem and mineral show in Tucson, Arizona. And he's walking through, and he's just sort of perusing all of the rocks that are out on the table. And he comes across this one. It's this, like, blue-violet sapphire. It's sitting there. Now, because rocks are his expertise, he immediately recognizes that this has value. So what he does is he takes it. Now, it's labeled $15, and he knows it's worth more than that. So he takes this rock and he walks over to the guy who's running the rock show, not but like a rock and mineral show, and he sets it down and he said, hey, can we talk about this? Um, it, it, it's on a table, it says $15. And the guy looks at the brother and says, you know what, we got so many of those, how about I make you a deal? I'll sell it to you for 10, 10 bucks. How's that for a giving challenge? So he just drops that 10, plays it very calm, takes the rock, walks out, gets it appraised, and he finds out that it's actually like a almost a 2,000 carat sapphire. It's a one of a kind, and it appraises for $2.3 million. Now, why I share that story, (laughs) number one, if you, you I was thinking, Nikki, when we, she's got family in Arkansas, and Nicholas, every time we saw one of those rock and geode shops on the side of the road, we'd stop and pick them up. I'm going to go get those things priced today. I'll give the money to the church, promise, but I'm going to check those things out. That story inspired me. But here's the thing. It took a lover of stones to recognize the value of what was in front of him. And here's the gospel. We have the lover of souls who would step off of his throne, come into our world in the person of Jesus and see the value that's found in cracked and broken and messy clay jars. 
Friends, I'm going to say it over and over again. We're generous because the gospel is generous. You need to know no matter the sin, no matter the brokenness, you have value. And the reason we have this cross right here at the center of the stage is this reminder that we are all on level ground at the foot of the cross. Jesus doesn't look at you and see brokenness. He doesn't see shame. He doesn't see pain. He sees someone who has value, and that, my friends, is generosity. He became the sacrificial lamb so that we would have the forgiveness of sins. And when you understand this, all of a sudden what you start to see, let me go to Titus. Titus chapter 3, you start to see that all throughout the New Testament, there's just this awareness to the generosity of the gospel, Paul writes to Titus this in Titus 3, 4. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. Not because of righteous things that we had done, but here's why. Because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit whom he poured out on us, what's the word? Generously. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So to understand that we're generous people because the gospel is generous is to also know this. To be a generous church is to be a people that share in Christ's heart. To know the sacrifice that he made is to know that we get to play a role in this. One commentator wrote this from Titus when I was studying it. I thought it was so good. He said, inside the soul of every person is a desire that God gave us to live the generous life. Generosity is essential to following Jesus. What Jesus invites us to do in this life cannot be done, listen, without a generous attitude. Here's what he says. Generosity is required to trust God at the depth that produces a life of sacrifice, a life of serving others, and a life of even forgiving in the same way that we are forgiven. Generosity has all of these layers that are wrapped up in it. And this last line is so good. We can give without love, but we cannot love without giving. And see, it all really kind of boils down to, listen, you want to kind of get away from this. It's almost easier. Let me just give the money to the church and then just be done with it. But no, no, no. There's so much more that comes when you understand the generosity of the gospel. Jesus, in John 13, 35, said this. This is how they will know that you are my disciples. Who's they? That's an unbelieving world. This is how they're going to know that you are my disciples by the way that you love by the way that you love and ultimately then it leads me to this second corinthians chapter 9 which really was the inspiration for this word we're preaching this on all of our different venues campus wide second corinthians 9 so let me give you just a little bit of context here um what you have in in second corinthians 9 the apostle paul is um he's talking about there was a church in first century jerusalem and they were struggling financially. It was hard in Jerusalem. There was a lot of martyrdom, a lot of persecution. But what you found were there were widows, there were orphans, there were poor, and the church was struggling. So this first church, Jerusalem, was solely dependent upon the gifts of another church that they had never met and more than likely never would. And that church was Corinth. Corinth was the church that had committed to the Apostle Paul to help fund and gift and be generous to this little startup church in Jerusalem. Now, let me talk about Corinth for just a minute. Actually, it's hard to believe. This was almost a year ago. Um, I got a picture. Let me show you. Uh, this is Corinth. Um, when we did the, uh, the travels of Paul last spring, got an opportunity to, to walk in the, the marketplace. So if you can imagine, this is a, a bit of a stretch, but Market Street here in the Woodlands, that, that would have been Market Street in Corinth. Now, the interesting thing is Paul, when you talk about generous, Paul um, actually moved into Corinth before he established a church. And Paul was a tent maker. 
So rather than just come in and, and shake a fist and preach at people, do you know what Paul did? Paul set up shop in Corinth, more than likely right here in this marketplace, and he worked for a year and a half of his life. Why? Practicing his trade, being generous with the gifts that God had given him, but also developing relationships, right? So here's what we know about Corinth. With the marketplace, with everything they've discovered, Corinth was an incredibly affluent place. There was a lot of money in Corinth, and Corinth had stopped sending money to Jerusalem. So what Paul knew was, if we're not careful, great affluence can lead to this place of comfort and comfort's not a bad thing but here's the danger if you're not careful comfort can breed complacency comfort can breed complacency and what Corinth found was they almost got so invested in the bubble what they could see that they forgot they were called to be a generous people beyond what they couldn't see so Paul reminds them He doesn't beat them over the head and say this is how bad you are, but he reminds them of what generosity is about. In fact, he says this. I love this. Paul says, this most generous God who gives seed to the farmer that becomes bread for your meals is more than extravagant with you. He gives you something that you can then give away which grows into full-formed lives, robust in God, wealthy in every way, so that you can be, say it, generous in every way, producing with us great praise to God. In other words, you trust that God has been generous to you, So be generous back in the way that you live and in the way that you love. And what you find is generosity. It doesn't just stir something in you, make you alive to what God is doing in the world, but it also leads other people to be a people of praise. It leads them into the goodness of what God is doing for them in their life. That's why in Acts, you just see, you see this phrase, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. And it's just this simple but necessary act of generosity. Here's what I want you to get. Generosity is not just something that God wants from us. Don't look at it that way. Generosity is not just something that God wants from us. Instead, it's something he desires for us. It's something he desires. So the question is, Are we living the generous life? I got one of those Saturday inspirations. I had to go buy some random things. We don't do a children's sermon. We do on occasion, so just consider this your children's sermon visual. Here's here's the way I would actually see it in regards to generosity. Like you you honestly, you 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 have the you have the option of living the kind of generous life that's a lot like this. It's a bucket. And you live your life and you get what you get and it's a good thing and you collect it and and you have it and it's contained and it's safe and it's great. And at the end of your life, you go, look, there it was. Or perhaps a better way to view it is this. It's a pipe. Now, the beauty of a pipe is what a pipe does. It's similar to what a bucket will do. In the sense that you have these precious commodities, you've got water, you have gas, and it goes through the pipe. So in a sense, the pipe holds it, but listen, it doesn't contain it. It doesn't keep it to itself, but instead, what it does is it allows whatever that precious commodity is, it allows it to pass through and it distributes it. Friends, when you allow the generosity to get We're a generous people because the gospel is generous. To understand what Christ has done is to allow that to flow through you. It doesn't stop with you, but you pass that generosity on and you find that it changes things. Be a pipe. Don't be a bucket. Here's what I find. When it comes to to generosity, 
I just love just a simple step of saying yes to the church, joining the church, but not being an audience member. Like, I, I, I want to raise here an army, not an audience. So when you step into the church, when all of a sudden you allow the gifts that God has given you and you plug in what you find is it changes not just you, but it changes your perspective. It changes your relationships. I love that we've got some stories over the course of this stewardship series. So as we move into the table, I want you to watch our friends, the Brimer family, share their story with you right now. We moved to the Woodlands in like 2013 and started coming pretty quickly after that. At the time, it was just kind of convenient. We had different obligations on Sundays. Uh, maybe Saturday night was a, a little bit social, stayed up late. Um, and if we missed church, it wasn't a big deal. It wasn't really until we had kids and our son was around one and we wanted to baptize him. And to do that here, you needed to be a member. We had been feeling pretty convicted to join for a while but that was the real like hard stop that we needed to just do it. Our church experience has been a journey from day one, very minimal to now, pretty active. We don't do it because we get anything back, but there's certainly a, uh, it was like the more that we gave, the more and the more that we showed up, our life just kept improving and getting yeah. different, changing and getting better. We started to see God really towards the beginning. Um, and it was just like, it didn't matter what area of our life we were looking at. If there was something we were struggling with or feeling uncomfortable with, everything just started to fall into place. I remember looking up one day and realizing that I had been feeling I don't, down or just anxious about not having a community of um, women uh, to be friends with. Not, my son didn't have a community of friends. And because we were here at the church so often, I realized that my entire friend group was really starting to expand as a result of the church. It just feels like the more we gave and the more we trusted, the more we really committed, it didn't matter what it was, there was an answer. We were praying for wisdom about things and praying for discernment and got it. Every relationship we have right now that we're able to pour into them and they're able to pour into us are because, not we sat next to them on Sunday morning, but because of the extra things that we've done here at the church to get plugged in and have a community. If I could just show myself like, 10 years ago where we are now, it would have been a no-brainer. Just start where you can. Mm -hmm. um, I wish that I would have started faster and done more, um, but take the first step. We found that the more we've plugged into the church, the more it's, it's poured back into us. Yeah. Well, here's the thing, the Woodlands Methodist Church, we're not growing an empire. We're growing the kingdom. That's what this is about. And I love that line, just start wherever you are. And I can't think of a better way to approach the table than being reminded of the truth that we've said over and over, because the gospel is generous, we're generous. We look back and we're reminded of a meal where Jesus sat with his friends. Far from perfect, messy in every possible way. But yet I believe Jesus smiled at his friends. He took the bread him he broke it and he gave thanks for it and he said this is my body which is given for you I want you to take eat and when you do do this in remembrance of me and there was a cup before him and he took it and he gave thanks he said this is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins drink this and as often as you do do this in remembrance of me Friends, the sacrament of Holy Communion is this beautiful reminder that as we come forward, we come with empty hands. But here's the thing. We walk away from this table with filled hearts. Why? Because Jesus meets us where we are and the body and the blood has changed everything. So let me pray over these elements as I do. If you're assisting in Holy Communion, if you will come forward and go ahead and take your elements and go to your station before we receive communion. Let me pray over these elements now. Just as you bow your heads, let me just make this invitation. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus, if you've never professed him as your Lord and Savior, invite him in. Just pray this prayer, Jesus. I don't have it all figured out, but I trust you. 
I receive the gift of salvation. I invite you into my heart. I confess my sins, and I want you to do a new thing in me and through me. Father, I'm grateful for this meal. I'm grateful that the ground is level at the foot of the cross. We all stand in the shadow of incredible generosity that's come through your son. So I just, before we, before we bless these elements, Father, it's important to have clean hands before we go to the dinner table. So if there's sin, if there are things in us that are not of you, silently, we just pause and we expose those dark places to you. generosity is this for those who confess their sins he is faithful and just to forgive us of those sins the slate is clean so God I ask your blessings on these elements bread the cup that they may become for us the body of Christ as we are a people who are redeemed by his blood we love you Jesus we thank you for this dinner invitation for this table and it's in the mighty name of Jesus that we pray, amen. A reminder that all are welcome to God's table this morning, to the Lord's table. Um, you see four corners here, but just don't see corners. Think about it. We join brothers and sisters around the world who share in this meal. Um, we take communion by intinction. All of the bread is gluten-free today. So the bread that you receive, you will just take that. We'll place it in your hands. You dip it in the cup, and you receive it at that time. Friends. Maybe you have an empty heart. Let it be filled by the generosity of who God is and what he's done for us through his son. Amen. Come as the ushers direct.